we are going on live on YouTube live streaming. Hello, yes, we are we are live. I can confirm that. And let us start admitting our viewers onto the meetings uh, video meeting room. Apart from those who are joining us from from YouTube, and without further uh, introduction. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to, to be here. My name is uh, Juan Ramon, and I work at the University of Cadiz within the framework of the ResearchU project. In this ResearchU project, one of our main objectives is to incentivize and to, in fact, promoting uh, research telling across the CU Alliance. And in this first webinar of the CU Talent Initiative, we are here to well to hear and to listen to several presentations uh, conducted by researchers all across the alliance. In this first webinar, related to the social sciences and and the humanities. Uh, without further introduction, I will start presenting broadly speaking the um, the main sections in which this webinar will be divided. Uh, firstly, it will, there, we will have a section focused on history with three different speakers from the University of Gdansk and the University of Cadiz. Secondly, we will have our section on psychology and education with speakers from the University of Gdansk and the University of Western Brittany. And thirdly, our last section on environment, transport and health. Uh, will be there will be three researchers in this case from the University of Cadiz, the University of Gdansk, and the University of Malta. In this first section, the section on history, our first um, our first speaker will be Karol Klojinski. He works as an assistant professor at the Department on Han on Ancient History at the University of of Gdansk. And in, during his presentation, he will be explaining us how drawing from Latin inscriptions, the author has explored the history of the ancient Roman town of Mastis, which, correct me if I am wrong, please, is located in, which is currently uh, Tunisia. So, Carol, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much for your participation. And, and please, when you want, we invite you to, to proceed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thank you. I will share my presentation now. Uh, I hope that you uh, you are you see my my presentation. Hello, I'm very glad uh, that today I could present my research interests. Uh, my current project is concentrated on epigraphical research in Roman town Mustis, Mustis in Tunisia. And it is the result of the scientific cooperation with the Tunisian National Heritage Institute and the Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology and Institute of Archaeology uh, of University uh, of Warsaw. Uh, since 2019, I am a member of the Tunisian Polish Archaeological Mission. I would like to add that at the beginning of uh, last month, I conducted my epigraphical survey in Mustis for two weeks. So my today presentation is updated. Within the project, together with uh, Professor Mohamed Abid from the University of Banuba in Tunis, we are preparing uh, catalogs of Latin inscriptions from Mustis. So it is the main aim uh, of our work, of our project. Uh, first, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, first I would like to give you some basic information uh, about the history of Mustis and Latin epigraphy in general, uh, as one of the auxiliary uh, sciences of history. Then I would like to show you a few interesting uh, Latin inscriptions from Mustis, which like papyri in Egypt, uh, are the main source of knowledge about the life of inhabitants uh, of Roman cities in social, economic, religious, and administrative aspects. Uh, first, I would like to say about the uh, location of Mustis. Where is Mustis? Mustis lies uh, about 
124 kilometers uh, to the southwest of the Tunisian capital, Tunis, near the modern town of El Crib in the Siliana Governorate. It is only 12, uh, 12, 12 kilometers uh, from Dugga, and one of the largest Roman sites in the province inscribed on the World Heritage List, UNESCO. Uh, uh, Mustis, uh, as you can see in the next slide, Mustis is located in the highly urbanized region of the Roman province Africa Proconsularis, on the main route leading from Carthage to Teveste in today's Algeria. Thanks to its ge geographical location on a very important uh, trade route and the surrounding fertile land where grain, olives, and wines were cultivated, the town and its inhabitants got rich very quickly in the early Roman Empire from the first to the third uh, century AD. Uh, in the next slide, you can see uh, the ancient Roman shops, Bitik, uh, which are localized uh, near the main street in the town. Mustis has not only Roman, but also Numidian uh, history, which is still very mysterious. In the end of the second century uh, BC, veterans of the great commander, Roman commander Gaius Marius, settled this town down during the reign of the uh, Emperor Tiberius in the beginning of the first uh, century, Mustis was granted the status of Roman municipium. The early Roman Empire is the most significant period of economic development of the entire North Roman Africa, as well as of Mustis. The history of the town and the region in the late antiquity uh, when it, it, it was a uh, headquarter of Christian bishop, uh, about one of them, Felicianus St. Augustine wrote. And in Muslim time, is virtually unknown, and its reconstruction is fragmentary and hypothetical only. Uh, in the next slide, you can see Google map of the uh, archaeological site uh, of Mustis. Uh, this map perfectly shows that the current archaeological site contains two hectares, two hectares. But the geophysical, last geophysical research allow, allows us to assume that the town has an additional over three, uh, 30 hectares, over 50 hectares. The preserved buildings include temples of Pluto, Apollo and Ceres, two honorific arcs, Roman baths, uh, Byzantine citadel, uh, Christian basilica, uh, a town square, a commercial street, which you, which you, which you saw on the photo, um, and at least two big Roman uh, houses. The function of numerous over architectural structures has not yet been uh, determined because Mustis, in opposite uh, to, for example, Dugga or Carthage was not was not excavated a lot, uh, very limited to works uh, were conducted on the side by the French and uh, in the thirties, sixties, uh, and seventies in the twentieth century. I, I don't have a time to give a full lecture about uh, Latin epigraphy, Roman epigraphy. But I, do, but I would like to give you a brilliant example, uh, which shows the big potential of this auxiliary science of uh, history. Who has not heard about of Suetonius, uh, the imperial biographer, biographer? His scholarly and exciting lives uh, of Caesars, from Julius Caesar to Domitians, uh, to Domitian, have influenced later Roman writers from the Middle Ages. Yes. Like many of Roman authors, we know so well the literature they wrote, but we don't know more about their life. And what is interesting, in 1952, uh, two eminent scholars, uh, Flom and Erwan Marek, 
published a new inscription from Hippo Regius in Algeria. And uh, this inscription was exciting, yes, uh, was very interesting. Why? Because it gave uh, details of Suetonius' life, yes? And in next uh, slide, you can see this inscription. And uh, as you can see, this inscription uh, was badly damaged, yes, uh, of the original plaque, just 16 fragments survived. After a long discussion, Flom and Marek restored the text as follows. You can read this text uh, from this slide, yes, we don't have a time of, uh, to, to give a full uh, text, but see, we have new uh, posts, new offices of, uh, of uh, Suetonius, yes, we have a studis, a bibliotecis, a epistolis imperatoris, Traiani, Hadriani, Augusti. So we have new in information about his career, about his, in Latin, cursus honorum. Okay? Uh, so uh, um, uh, this uh, inscription shows us very well how important inscriptions on studies in antiquity are. Several areas in Roman civilization are known almost endlessly through inscriptions. The development and use of Roman personal names, the oldest phases of Latin language, the organization of uh, Roman uh, army, uh, of Rome, provincial towns, and so on. So inscriptions, the text carved, uh, or in some special cases painted, on stone or on some other hard, durable, inorganic material are a vast source material that complements in a very important manner the information obtained from other sources. Inscriptions are important for anyone uh, interested in the Roman world, in the Roman culture, with, with, whatever they regard themselves as literary scholars historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, uh, or uh, army specialists. The discipline that studies inscription written in Latin is called Latin yes, uh, from the Greek word epigraphein, to write on, to write over. The principal task of Latin epigraphy remains to collect, decipher, uh, edit, and publish written inscriptions. Uh, the next uh, slide I would like to say about the of uh, Latin inscriptions uh, from uh, the Roman Empire is yes, because uh, the sheer number of uh, inscriptions uh, is enormous, despite the fact that the survival rate of the Latin uh, inscription is estimated as mere as five percent, five percent at best. Over three hundred thousand Latin inscriptions have been found. And every year, new dis discoveries, new discoveries, especially in, from Africa proconsularis, from African provinces, uh, increase the, the number by hundreds. From Roman provinces, as you can see in the slide, we know over 50,000 published Latin inscriptions. And what is um, interesting, and interesting, the great majority of them um, uh, date from the imperial period, especially in the, from the second and the beginning of the third century. It was the time of epigraphic uh, boom, epigraphic boom in the whole Roman Empire. Okay, uh, so uh, now I would like to show you next, uh, next, uh, next slide, and it is our uh, workshop. It is the ancient uh, citadel, lapidarium, modern lapidarium, which we have, uh, where, uh, in which we uh, inventoried uh, a lot of uh, Latin Roman inscriptions. Yes, and uh, in the next sl slide, you can see uh, me and uh, Professor Mohammed uh, Abid uh, and. Uh, uh, we, ha we have in the citadel, as you can see, we have uh, Roman stand, 
we have uh, uh, Roman funerary inscriptions, yes, the most popular category of uh, inscriptions. And now I would like to, uh, to tell you about categories of inscriptions, but first I would like to tell you about, uh, about the inscriptions from Mustis, yes, because you know, uh, from Mustis, over 90 inscriptions uh, were published, 90. Next, about 400 are waiting for publication. Together with Professor Mohamed Abid, uh, since 2019, we inventoried 302, 302 uh, Latin inscriptions, totally or fragmentary preserved, of course, yes. Uh, and almost all the inventoried inscriptions are unpublished and come from the lapidarium, lapidarium what you, which you see uh, uh, in the slide, uh, uh, in the slide, yes. So uh, now about I would like to say about uh, types of inscriptions, yes. Uh, uh, the difference between public and private inscriptions and is the most significant, but we can offer the more detailed distinction on funerary, honorary, uh, building uh, inscriptions, milestone, border stone. Stones, inscriptions on portable, uh, portable uh, objects like uh, Instrumenta Domestica. The most famous are from in Mustis. We, we, have, uh, we don't have uh, uh, the examples of uh, uh, Instrumenta Domestica, yes? Um, but uh, while honorific inscriptions comprise the most prestigious category of Roman inscriptions, epitaphs, Epitaphs, funerary inscriptions, tombstones are the most numerous, no less than three quarters of all ancient Latin inscriptions belong to this uh, type. Yes, and now I would like to show you uh, some uh, interesting inscriptions from Mustis. Here you, uh, and uh, I must add that uh, all photos, all inscriptions, are unpublished. Yes, you see a uh, new material, new material from this Roman town. Yes. So first inscription you can see it's a funerary stone, uh, tombstones of uh, the man who uh, lived in uh, the early Roman Empire, and we can read: "Dis manibus sacrum Caius Minucius Gaiulus Pius Pius Pius." It's uh, the most popular epithet. Uh, especially in uh, uh, African epigraphy, but also in the Spanish Af epigraphy, yes, yeah, Spanish epigraphy. Uh, and we uh, we have uh, he lived uh, uh, he lived uh, fifty five years, yes. Nona ginta kvinkfa, hic situs est. Here is buried, yes, or light. Here, here is buried, yes. And this formula, this manibus sacrum, it's very popular, and it means for the departed spirits, spirits, yes, for the departed spirits. Here we have, you know, a very interesting uh, relief, relief with the donkey and with the farmer of the true or the trader, yes, uh, from Mustis, and it is very interesting uh, inscription. Next one. Uh, is um, is connected is connected with the fertility of land of the with the fertility of land yes because we have uh, you know we have two peaks on the left and on the right side yes and it, it, this is interesting description because this is inscription of women uh, perhaps uh, priest women yes flaminica in Latin or sacerdota yes and we could read. DMS, this manibus sacrum to the departed spirits, Vitellia, Lucifilia, the daughter of Lucius, Fartina, Pia, Vixit Annis Octaginta. So she lived uh, 60s, yes. And the next uh, very early inscription, very early inscription, because we have a lunar crescent uh, in the upper part of the, of the stone. Uh, and you see, we have here very nice and very interesting name of this man. We have Felix Mandalio. Yes, Felix, happy, is the most popular name 
of Roman slaves, yes, of Roman uh, slaves, but also of Peregrini. So non, uh, so people who doesn't have a Roman, uh, who, who don't have a Roman citizenship, yes. And you have Felix Mandario. What is interesting? Felix is Felix is a Roman name, but Mandario is Numidian, yes. So here we have a very well uh, example of a very nice example of uh, Romanization of Romanization, of process of Romanization. Yes? And then we have uh, the, the formula Pius Vixit Annis, uh, Vixit Annix, six, Sexaginta Quinque. He lived 60 uh, years. Uh, here is buried, uh, buried, buried, uh, he, uh, so uh, uh, hic situs est, yes? Next inscription is the dedication. You can see in the slide uh, the dedication to Divus Hadrianus, yes, to Divus Hadrianus in Latin, Divo Hadriano Augusto, DDPP, it's abbreviation, and we can do develop this, uh, uh, follows a uh, decreto de curionum pecunia publica, yes, uh, basing on the decurion's decree by public money, yes. So uh, what is interesting, we could date um, this inscription precisely because uh, uh, Hadrianus died in 138. Yes, so this inscription must be founded after after this time. Yes, so uh, this is very interesting inscription and uh, the, the type of the stone. It is a base of statue. Yes, so in the antiquity of Hadrianus must be uh, in the upper part of the of this monument of this monument. Okay. And uh, the last one, we yes, because we don't have a time. Uh, the last one inscription is very interesting, I think, and it is inscription, ins inscription uh, not from the early Roman Empire, but from the late Roman Empire. Yes, it is uh, miliarium. Yes, it is miliarium. It's milestones, uh, and uh, this uh, inscription is dated to uh, to the reign of Constantius the second the half of the fourth uh, century. And uh, in this inscription, we have the name, the full name of the city. Yes, we could read Municipium Iulium Aurelium Mustitanum. Yes, Iulium Aurelium Mustitanum. These names are uh, related to uh, to the laws, to the status, uh, greater status of municipium, yes, which, which, which was uh, given by uh, Tiberius and uh, next uh, laws uh, given by uh, somebody of Aureli. We could we don't we don't know. Maybe Marcus Aurelius, but maybe Caracalla. He was also Aurelius. Yes. So it is it is very very uh, very interesting. And uh, the, the 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 last uh, formula: Devotum numini majestatique eius, devoted to his divine divine power. Um, divine power and his majesty, yes? And uh, the slide uh, is presenting uh, uh, mosaics, yes, Christian mosaics. So uh, the real treasure of Mustis uh, is not only inscriptions, but are also mosaics, coins, and other uh, very interesting artifacts which are uh, found, uh, which are founded by my my colleagues, my uh, Tunisian and uh, Polish uh, colleagues who are uh, who are uh, excavating the city. Yes, and my project, which I must add, is founded by the Science Center in Poland, and uh, the title is "Reading African Palimpsest: The Dynamics of Urban and Rural Communities of Numidian and Roman Muslims, Afripal." Yes. Uh, the director of uh, this project is uh, Professor Tomasz Waliszewski from the University of Warsaw. And what is interesting, I published uh, uh, two papers, uh, important papers uh, in, uh, in, in German uh, journal, uh, prestigious German journal, Zeitschrift für Papyrologie und Epigraphik. And uh, our last paper, uh, Fulvius Paternus, a new primi pilar, a Gregius Wirt from Mustis, Musti, Tunisia. Uh, you can you could read uh, in my profile on academia.
Yes, so uh, if somebody is more interested uh, in this uh, quest, uh, question or my uh, research interest could, uh, could read uh, these two papers. And in uh, the end, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Indeed, thank you very much to, to you, Carol, for your exciting presentation, uh, Roman history and how uh, it uh, it pervaded the different peoples that they that the Romans took contact with is a, is an exciting topic, and uh, and we are sure that maybe this uh, this event is a good opportunity for for you to get in contact with other uh, researchers in the in the same field. Um, um, the next uh, the next uh, presentation uh, within the section of history will be delivered by Carlota Perez Reverte. She is a researcher at the, uh, at the Marine Archaeology Department of the University of Cadiz, and she will be explaining to all of us how uh, the research conducted by her team uh, is dealing with a underwater, underwater cultural heritage and how it, uh, it, uh, it creates advantages and, and benefits their cultural, social, and economic surroundings. So Carlota, if, if you are ready, feel welcome. I am, I am. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your kind presentation and also for letting me be here today, sharing my job. And now I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, okay. I think it's... Done. Okay, and I also wanted to congratulate Carol because as an archaeologist, I enjoyed very much his passionate speak. And now that we can travel, I have a new destiny in, in my mind. So um, yes, this is the work of my uh, department in the university. I'm an underwater archaeologist. And we, the University of Cardiff is the only university with a line of research uh, for underwater archaeology. It's the only university in Spain. And also the only university in Spain with an um, official master for students uh, in underwater archaeology. We have, um, we've been working for six years and we have a multi-purpose sheet that we share with other C departments in the university and can also be um, like rented to other teams or projects or universities. And we have our own restoration labs for the artifacts that we take out from the water. Right now, we have several projects going on. We have, uh, all of them have a part for research and a part for kind of uh, the transfer of knowledge, which is my department and my specialty. We have these na two national projects, Proyecto Heracles and Steamboat Route, that are meant to end in the creation of an underwater park in the Strait of Gibraltar. I will show a map later. Then we have a UMAR, which is an Erasmus project for educating the tourism operators in the developing of products related to heritage. We also have an interreg type project, which is um, also for the creation of tourist products related to maritime and underwater heritage um, on the Atlantic area. And the CREAMARE, another interreg, but in the Mediterranean, linked to virtual heritage. So what we are doing in, in our line in, in the university is to focus all these projects in the same space, which is something that normally is not done. Why? Well, first, this is the space. This is the um, Cadiz is in the south of Spain. This is the, um, the Bay of uh, Gibraltar. And we are concentrating our projects here because this city has a high rate of unemployment and also has some um, industry based on oil companies and merchant ships, a bit of sun and beach, um, but no heritage at all. Another city is trying to rebrand itself, uh, linking its identity to the heritage and the maritime history. So we are trying to help in this department. As I was saying, um, first uh, we do research and um, is what we did here. Uh, we've been working here for three years and we found, because there was no archaeological chart, we didn't know what we have here. And we found more than 150 sites, underwater sites, archaeological sites, most of them shipwrecks from Roman times till contemporary times. So 
uh, we are prioritizing those that are more exposed. As you can see in this picture, some of them are very shallow, very close to the shore. The people is already diving there, taking things out. So these are the ships that we are like paying more attention. But we are uh, documenting all the all the sites. Um, sometimes we um, take samples. Sometimes we make small excavations. Sometimes we make whole excavation of the ship, depending on what we think uh, it's needed. And we gathered information through technologies like probe, magnetometer, or some bottom profiler that machines to know what's in the bottom. And also by uh, speaking to the local community, going to the archives, gather information from, from other sources. As I was saying, um, sometimes we have to make a full excavation. We find some interesting artifacts. As you can see, we take them to the labs and then to the museum. That's one part of our job. And this is where my job begins. My job is to see, um, I understand that we are creating some capital, which would be a cultural capital that can be of use for the city. So my job is to see how can we transfer this knowledge on a um, creative, if I can, and efficient way, and to find stakeholders to develop different kinds of experiences. So we take these projects, we do our research, we have this um, cultural capital, and what we do is to develop the cultural products, the experiences. We don't, mm, we don't take profit, we don't, we don't do tourism. That's what we do with our stakeholders, and they will develop these products under our supervision. So um, they will have complementary services, if we are lucky, complementary funding, uh, and that's how we can get to a much larger target audience. Of course, all of this is under our supervision, so we um, are sure that these products are responsible and sustainable for the environment and for the heritage. And that's what we are doing under the principles of the new European guidelines of blue economy and blue growth, and also the new guidelines for the ocean, ocean decade. And these are some of the, of the outcomes that we are going to some of them are already done, but during the, this year, I hope. The first one is this tourism toolkit. It was um, an outcome of my PhD. And it is for tourism operators. It's already online on the web page of the type project. Um, it has, um, it's to explain how can they develop these products, which steps should they take, which professional should be involved in each step. And at the end of each chapter, they have exercises. So if they read the book and do the exercises, by the end of the book, they might have a pretty good draft of, of an experience. The second thing, uh, the second outcome would be this um, underwater cultural park. We want to have five sites open by next summer. With, but that means we are also training the guides. We are also working with the diving centers. We have also to put panels on the water. We have to make a, through uh, a very great research before. Um, now the part of the research is done and we are um, trying to, to do all the logistic uh, stuff. The third thing is um, an streaming boy that uh, the engineers inside the type project developed. It's a way to put over a site while we are working on the water. So we can transmit audio and video in real time through internet to land. That means we can um, broadcast to school or to a university or to a museum and uh, tell in real time, because it also has cameras on the water, uh, tell in real time what we are doing and people can be underwater with us. Um, this uh, boy is already um, functional, but we, um, we can arrange uh, a broadcasting, but our goal is to integrate that in our website in a permanent way. We'll see if with some of the projects to come, we, we can get the funding. The third thing we are doing is uh, a video game, a serious game. And we, we provided the history and the 3D model of the real artifacts. And a company, a French company, is developing the video game. It's already done, but we don't have yet the glasses to test it. So I cannot say how good it is because we've only saw uh, small videos, but I found them quite promising. And finally, we have um, 
the art glasses and augmented reality experiences to be placed in different museums and interpretation centers of Algeciras. Um, what, what we do is that we, we bought the, the glasses, we gave it to the, to the museums and the, and the centers, and they will keep uh, maintaining them. We don't have to spend more money, but our compromise is to keep feeding them with new content. So as we are concentrating all our projects in there, we, um, we are developing new content every year. We also have invited other researchers from our university, uh, such as biologists or geologists, to share their data and to create content also for the glasses. I think that's a very good thing because um, in their projects, they can have um, an outcome that it is a um, virtual reality product without um, to buy the glasses because there are already the glasses, so let's all use them. Um, and that's um, most of what we want to achieve. Our challenge now is how we, I said we wanted to create some impact in the city um, to help the city to rebrand, and also to see if we can create a um, positive impact on the tissue, economical, social, and cultural tissue of the city. So our challenge now, since we are archaeologists and we don't do social economy, is to see how are we going to measure that and how are we going to make it also in a scientific way. And that's also the part of the investigation I am currently working on. Um, that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and you have my email if you have any doubts or anything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you. Thank you very much, Carlota, for your interesting presentation. It has been quite interesting, at least to me, how there are plenty of possibilities for, for the humanities to contribute to the knowledge transfer and to, uh, and to the economic social development of our of our regions, which are things that are usually mostly related with uh, science and technology, with higher hard science projects, so to speak. Whereas there are plenty of possibilities in in this realm when it comes to to the humanities and to the well to the exploration of our uh, past and our cultural heritage. So thank you very much, and I am sure that plenty of of people will be interested in in knowing more about your your projects. The next speaker and, and the last one for this section on history is uh, Michalina Petelska. She comes from the University of Gdansk and works as an assistant professor at its Institute of History. His, uh, his presentation under the title Museums and Migrations will be uh, an opportunity for her to show us, to explain to us how a historian as she is, has been interested in migration museums and how museums, uh, given uh, their new trends, can contribute to solve the many challenges posed by today's uh, migratory movements and, and migrations. So uh, when you are ready, Michelina, we are, we are looking forward to, to listening to you. Uh, good morning. I hope that you can hear me. Uh, so I will share with you my screen for the beginning. Hope you can see it. Um, just a second. Okay, I hope that the presentation is now for you available. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so as you already know it, I'm a historian, PhD. Um, I'm very happy that I can be here today with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share some results of my uh, latest research um, here today with, with you. Um, so to begin with, um, as a historian, um, I researched the history of Poland uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, but being a historian dealing only with the history of Poland uh, means that the results of the research uh, are interesting only to a small audience, mainly Polish audience, Polish speaking audience. Um, so my idea is to be open to international and interdisciplinary cooperation like our meeting today. And to do it, I rather study history of Poland seen from outside. So my PhD thesis concerned the Polish-Danish relations in the 
19th centuries, 19th century. Um, as an example, I can um, share with you that it was absolutely interesting to read the source archive material from 19th century that testified the culture shock experienced by a Dane who came to Poland for the very first time in the end of the 19th century. So it is not strictly a history of Poland, in fact, rather the culture shock and meeting of two cultures. So in this way, I also study stereotypes and mutual uh, perceptions. Um, I'm a historian, but also uh, considering my job profile, I'm a museologist. Um, I have worked in museums and while working now at university, I also constantly collaborate with museums. As a museologist, I also believe that, that this is the best way to study the history of your own nation in contact with the others. So um, in 2017, for example, I was the curator of the exhibition entitled Poles in the Canadian Mosaic, 150 years of history. This exhibition was presented on two continents. I mean, here in Poland, but also in Canada for more than a one year. Um, as an academic teacher, I teach my students here at the University of Gdańsk um, many uh, subjects in the field of uh, museology. Uh, I attach particular importance to the subject of museum education. My goal is to train museum educators who understand the idea of the uh, inclusive museum. So um, I would like to emphasize that I combine this technique of a historian and a museologist. Um, and it is also connected with my research grant. Here, for example, on the um, PowerPoint presentation, you can see the title of the research grant from uh, our Polish National Science Center in Krakow. In 2019, I completed a research grant um, about a Polish immigration uh, in Norway and Sweden uh, in their museums. So I took another look at how Polish history is perceived outside Poland. So this time I checked how Scandinavian curators uh, in museums uh, present immigrants from, from Poland without us, with our, our opinions, how it is done simply uh, in Sweden and Norway. Um, being a historian museologist make me involved not only in researching the past, but also in vividly reacting to the present, thanks to being a museologist. So, for example, last year I prepared a paper analyzing how Polish museums behaved during the pandemic. Um, there is a method of uh, reacting quickly to the events taking place by creating a museum collection or exhibition, such, um, let's call it live documenting of events. It's called rapid response collecting. Um, and here on the PowerPoint presentation, you can see the title of the whole uh, paper article. I studied in this paper, um, which Polish museums used this method during the pandemic. Rapid response collecting is important in a social context because it usually means participation of local community in creating a collection documenting local life in some kind hard times, for example, pandemic times. Um, so today I'm waiting also for the very last speech where Mary uh, Bergelia will also present the results of pandemic research. I hope we can find something in common in our findings about uh, pandemia. However, I believe that the most fascinating issue in the field of museology are uh, migration museums. First of all, let me explain very briefly the difference between two uh, phenomena, migration museums and migration in different museums. It is slightly different things. The narrative of um, migration and activities for migrants, activities with migrants, 
are undertaken in many different types of museums, art museums, city museums, local museums, and many others. So uh, this is what I called uh, migration in different uh, museums. As you can see in the presentation slide, researchers have already noticed and analyzed um, the social role of museums as contact zones, as the contact, as the place of the contact between the newcomers and the host societies. I have selected only a few titles to draw your attention to this phenomenon, especially interesting is the last book uh, about museums as places of intercultural dialogue. Um, however, I noticed a definite lack. Um, there are no research on typical migration museums. What do I understand by migration museums? All over the world, there are museums entirely dedicated to migration. There are a reflection um, of the migration processes that took place from the 19th century until now. As you can see on the PowerPoint presentation, just a few examples. Uh, so reflecting the history of migration, uh, that is why there are many museums in Europe telling about the emigration from Europe to United States, to America in the 19th and 20th centuries, like Emigration Museum in Gdynia, Poland. Uh, on the other hand, in the United States or Canada, there are uh, museums talking about the same process, the process of immigration to that country. However, in the 20th and 21st century, so nowadays, many newcomers, new immigrants came to Europe. So um, this, this is why, for example, in Denmark, the new immigration museums have been created. And you can see here uh, Danish Immigration Museum in Farum, close to Copenhagen in, in Denmark. I can also list many other type of migration museums, such as open air migration museum or museum dedicated to specific event. Uh, here, for example, you can see the example uh, of the Partition Museum in India, uh, telling the story of the vision uh, of British India in uh, 1937, which caused mass migration between India and Pakistan, millions of, of people. A fascinating phenomenon are also small museums founded all over the world by local uh, communities. So um, you may ask um, whether the study of migration museum, which is my field of study, is just a description, just a description of an institution or real study of society. Well, on the basis of my research, of my studies, I'm absolutely convinced that migration museums are museums in a lively dialogue with the present. Um, today, we do not have time to discuss it in details, uh, but it should be emphasized that migration museums not only prepare exhibitions, but most of all um, conduct participation projects uh, and inclusive education for both migrants and host societies. Um, migration museums also form a global network. Uh, they are suitable partners for uh, geopolitical researchers, and this applies both to the historical aspects of migrations, as well as studies of refugees and uh, contemporary geopolitical situation. In this context, for example, now, uh, in this month, in this weeks, I'm currently observing the attitude of our Polish museums here towards the war refugees from Ukraine. Um, very interesting topic, and I can tell you that um, museums are active in um, being open and welcome for the refugees, preparing, for example, um, open um, exhibitions, tickets for free for Ukrainian refugees, special animation for children in uh, Ukrainian language to make possible in this time for parents, for mothers to look for a job, and many others. Uh, also, Polish museologists offer some um, job position for Ukrainian museologists and so on. So a great solidarity in the case, uh, in case of museums. And I can say that many Polish museums in some way became uh, migration museums nowadays, um, being so open for Ukrainian refugees. Um, finally, I would like to emphasize that migration museums are part of the public history. By this expression, public history, we mean history taught outside school and outside 
university. So at a time when scientists forecast that various types of migrations, um, climate migrations, war refugees, and so on, will be the greatest, uh, one of the greatest challenges uh, facing humanity. It is worth emphasizing that migration museums are places where people, very different people outside schools can acquire good quality knowledge about migration. And it was planned to be the end of my presentation, but if I can react very um, uh, now alive to what just uh, my, the previous speaker said, I would like to add now that um, migration museums are also very much connected with um, seaside, with the port cities. I also study a lot migration museums in port cities um, in the old uh, migration infrastructure. Um, if I can maybe uh, came back to one of this previous slide, for example, here what you can see, Immigration Museum in Gdynia, Ellis Island National Museum of Immigration in New York, in Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, all of them, all that three, just examples, are located in a very, uh, the heart of the ports, of the harbors, on the real um, coast. Uh, coast. Um, pier 21 is simply the, the, the name of the pier uh, in the port when, uh, where ocean liners used to uh, uh, stop to take um, the migrants. Why I'm telling that uh, in the connection with the previous speaker? Because um, studying migration museums in the former port infrastructure in the uh, port cities, it is also about uh, touristic um, tourist attractions, uh, creating new um, places for tourists and cultural heritage. Uh, for example, Immigration Museum in Gdynia is quite new institution, open in uh, 2015 um, in the real functioning port, uh, which up to that moment was just simply a port, so just the industry area. And opening museum in port um, was um, a move uh, to ask to, to invite tourists and local community to be more active in this part of uh, of the city. So, so um, I don't want to uh, take a more time that it was planned, but uh, I will, I'm also very open to discuss this aspect of um, uh, potential of old former uh, migration infrastructure in the port cities as a tourist uh, attraction important for the local uh, community, which I believe can um, be something in common for our uh, two um for our two field of um studies so um going to the end i would just like to to add that this year i prepared two articles in english uh, about migration museums and their involvement in contemporary migrations and also refugees crisis they are now in the process of printing so not ready yet but i hope we'll be ready this year so uh, I will be more than happy to share it with you if you will be um, interested. Well, so that's all for the 10 minute speech. I hope that I didn't uh, take more uh, time. Thank you for your attention. And I'm very open to um, discuss migration museums and a social and tourist role uh, of museums in, in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelina. Thank you very much to you for your throughout while at the same time a clarifying and concise presentation. Migrations are indeed a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, research field by, by themselves, and they require the participation from, from people all around the social sciences and, and humanities, I would say, from history to law to even from different subfields within, within history. And uh, they indeed are one of the main uh, topics for social sciences nowadays and and we are well we are very pleased to to have one one presentation one researcher dealing with with such an issue and from such a particular uh, approach and and point of view with uh, Michelina's presentation we have closed uh, the first section of this webinar uh, the, the one focused on history and we are about to kick off the second one 
the section on psychology and, and education within this CU Talent webinar. Our next speaker, Judita Borchette, uh, work as an assistant professor at the University of Gdansk as well, in this case, at the Institute of Psychology. And she will be explaining to us her latest research on parentification and uh, on different processes in which uh, there are different distorted divisions of responsibilities and roles within, within families. Uh, and well, she will be giving us the, her, her latest findings in, in this regard. So Judita, if, if you're ready, we are, we are ready to, to listen to you. Great, uh, good afternoon. So I will start uh, sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. We, we so uh, right. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, thank you very much for introducing me, uh, Juan. So my name is Judith Borhet, and uh, I am uh, representing the discipline of psychology. And today I would like to introduce you to the topic of my research and uh, latest findings. Uh, and uh, before I start, I would like to uh, say that uh, parentification has been my uh, research interest since my master's thesis. And then I continued that work on my PhD studies, uh, which I graduated in October. And I'm continuing uh, this work uh, on uh, with uh, some help of, uh, uh, of course, my uh, 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 co-workers and uh, uh, collaborates from United States, mainly Professor Lisa Hooper. Uh, the, mm, the presentation I prepared will be organized in uh, four major parts, so I will introduce the uh, topic of parentification. Then I will uh, want to show you uh, my previous works that were uh, um, building the foundations for further work in Poland uh, on the topic. Uh, and uh, this, I will discuss some works in progress and uh, what is planned for the future, uh, what also opens possibilities for collaboration. Uh, so parentification is uh, a family process that uh, is uh, highly related to neglect and uh, many psychopathological uh, uh, issues and phenomena in the family. Uh, the briefest definition of the process would be reversing the roles between the child or the teenager and the primary caregiver, usually the parent. So in this situation, the parent uh, is not performing his or her role because uh, uh, has some uh, troubles doing so or is uh, unable to do it. So that can be due to because of uh, being a person addicted to a psychoactive substance, substance or being a person with some kind of chronic physical or mental disease that makes the person not able to fully engage in the parental role uh, uh, an, another uh, reason for uh, uh, the parentification to happen in the family can be lack of one adult person in the family system. So uh, that uh, makes a gap in the family, which might be uh, filled by one of the children that takes up uh, the roles uh, of uh, the person that is not present uh, in sort of uh, attempt to uh, hold the family together, support the parent, uh, the single parent raising up the children, but at the same time, it might be detrimental for the child. Important notion is to differentiate parentification from responsibility, because we all can agree that uh, uh, during the development, children and adolescents, they encounter some challenges or difficult situations, uh, both they and, and the families, and uh, they need responsibilities to grow up, to build self-confidence, to learn new abilities. But uh, within the definition of parentification, the uh, important element uh, uh, that uh, makes this uh, situation non-normative is the fact that the 
tasks and responsibilities that the child performs are either not age appropriate, so not in line with the child's age and possibilities, or the amount of tasks and possibilities is overwhelming, so meaning it is too much of them, so that the child cannot perform his or her developmental roles. So their own uh, development is being disturbed due to the role performed in the family. Parentification can be uh, instrumental or emotional. The instrumental type of parentification would be performing physical help uh, for the family. So that can be taking care of the household, uh, uh, carry, attending to the younger siblings, or even making up money. Uh, uh, but uh, the more detrimental form of parentification is the emotional one. So in that case, the child becomes the person uh, that is regulating emotional and social needs of the family members, especially the parents. So we can imagine a child becoming uh, a mediator or a referee in the parents' uh, conflict, or a child that becomes a therapist for his or her parent, or a child uh, that uh, becomes a scapegoat or uh, helps parents uh, make uh, decisions that are too important and children should not be involved in making them. Uh, so uh, as we can, uh, one can uh, simply infer from that children uh, do not have enough emotional resources to deal with the problems that adults themselves can't. So a child is not an advisor, not a person to lift up an adult person uh, in uh, these kind of situations. Uh, the consequences of parentification uh, are very complex because on one hand, if the experience is moderate and usually instrumental, they can still be positive. If the child uh, will uh, know the, that, for example, the family is on the undergoing temporary crisis and the child is part of uh, what the family is doing to try uh, to cope with the pro problem, for example, let's imagine it's uh, one of the parents losing job and undergoing uh, problems because of that, and is withdrawn from uh, the parental role, then the child may uh, uh, have more responsibilities, but also learn self-efficacy, learn how to uh, care for others and uh, learn safe agency. But uh, uh, in other cases, especially in cases of uh, emotional parentification and when there are other problems in the family, like for example, uh, uh, addiction, uh, the consequences of parentification will be negative and that would involve uh, uh, problems with self-image, with identity, uh, with uh, overusing psychoactive, psychoactive substances in the future, underachievement at school and work, a tendency to perfectionism uh, and self-neglect. Uh, and the, the last point, uh, what I would like to mention about the definition of parentification is that it can be focused not only on the parents, but also on the siblings. Because if the child becomes the primary caregiver of the sibling, it's like replacing the parents. So it's still uh, performing parental role by, by the child. And uh, now I would like to uh, move on to uh, the work that uh, I have already done uh, with uh, my colleagues. Uh, uh, all of these papers were done during my, uh, uh, yes, all of them, during my uh, PhD studies. Uh, these are the most important ones I, I find. So. Before I could start work uh, on parentification, I had to deal with the problem that there were no standardized questionnaires in Poland that would allow, allow for measuring that phenomenon. So we had to start with psychometric work to create tools that would enable us to conduct uh, qu uh, quantitative studies. So uh, the effect of that work uh, uh, are two questionnaires. The first one is parentification questionnaire for youth, and that is the um, questionnaire uh, we have made on our own. 
And the second one, which has been uh, accepted for publication last week, <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm happy about that, uh, is the adaptation of uh, an American questionnaire called Parentification Inventory, developed by Professor Lisa Hooper. And uh, in collaboration with her and uh, her team, uh, we have prepared not only the Polish adaptation of that questionnaire, but also uh, other works that are currently under review. So it is very uh, fruitful cooperative. Uh, second, after we gathered the tools, before we could think about verifying if uh, some effects that have been observed in other populations, usually studies on parentification have been done in the United States, we had to gather information about the uh, state of the phenomenon in Poland. So uh, before we could try to build more complex models and try to replicate studies, we, we wanted to know how many children are affected, how many of them are boys and, and, and girls. Is that uh, uh, similar or different from what we observe in other studies? Because if those gender effects would be different than, uh, uh, for example, in the United States, it would be uh, worth uh, having uh, um, more thought about uh, replicating uh, other studies where gender was not uh, taken into consideration. Then we would know that it's. Uh, absolutely um, uh, it, it would it could be a different situation in our cultural setting so uh, the effect of that was a very big prevalence study published in 2021 and uh, that's uh, parentification in polish adolescents a prevalence study and uh, it is a really large sample uh, of data gathered from over 47000 polish adolescents and uh, uh, I, uh, I think that maybe I will be able to make some of you curious and uh, look up this, this publication uh, because there are uh, a lot of uh, interesting findings. I don't have time to discuss all that. I just want to <laughs> mention that uh, it's there and uh, you can look it up. And of course, we made uh, other exploratory studies. Uh, where we've been investigating not only adolescents, where we are examining their current experience. Uh, so in, in the questionnaire, the items refer to their actual experience now, but also made a few uh, studies, studies on adults where they have been assessing their uh, experiences related to parentification retrospectively, because uh, we can, uh, with regard to adult people, we can ask them, what, how was it when you've been growing up? Yes, of course, it, is, it has the retrospective bias, uh, but um, it seems to be, with regard to uh, assessing parentification in adults, it seems to be uh, a problem that everyone uh, uh, has, been, has been facing. And um, of course, we try to do that uh, we try to solve that uh, with uh, having the highest quality of our research tools. Uh, about recent works and works that are in progress, and uh, now I am working on uh, results of a family study uh, that I conducted uh, um, after um, receiving the grant from Polish National Science Center. Uh, that grant allowed me uh, not only to finalize the family triad studies in uh, uh, which there were both parents and adolescent child, so uh, three family members participating. There have been 170 families, so that's quite a lot as for a family study. And I also was able to visit Professor Hooper uh, at uh, Center for Educational Transformation at the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, as uh, international visiting scholar. So that was also part of that, uh, that grant. And also uh, we are still working on some uh, findings uh, from studies on young adults. So what is now? Uh, I think that uh, the more I learn about the phenomenon, the more I realize it's very complex, it's highly immersed in culture, 
uh, as of course uh, it is uh, a matter of social role. Family roles are uh, uh, only example of all the social roles we perform. So of course it's uh, highly immersed in culture. And Lisa Hooper uh, in her paper from 2014, she noticed that we need more and more studies that are conducted outside the United States because most of what we know, uh, most of the theories have been developed after studies on American people. Uh, and uh, uh, that is of course not representative for uh, uh, all the people and so we need to um, have uh, more and more studies from various countries uh, uh, as an attempt to enable that uh, the questionnaire uh, me and my colleagues developed for uh, teenagers uh, i know it's now under adaptation in turkey germany and czech republic uh, personally i'm collaborating with the german team and Professor uh, Frederike Gerstenberg. Um, but uh, of course, uh, we are open for um, allowing other research teams and providing them materials to make further adaptations so that we could, we all could make more cross-cultural studies, involve populations from more countries uh, and uh, learn more about what the children and teenagers in our countries are experiencing uh, how uh, the roles they perform at their families are related to their health, their future and well-being. So uh, I'm open for any uh, collaboration opportunities. I'm happy to share uh, materials and information if anyone uh, would like to know more. Uh, here is my email and please feel free to contact me. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, for your attention, it was a pleasure for me. Thanks to you, Yudita. Thank you very much for your presentation. It has been uh, it has been impressive, I have to say, and and it allows a uh, it allows a lot of comparative research in in that regard. As as you have stated, I, I believe that social psychologists always will always have to to struggle with the fact that expected behaviors in different uh, environments are never the same and yes. especially the, the differences between between uh, northern american and european social environments is is quite remarkable and in fact there are plenty of of things to to research and to discover in in that real so That's thank you true. very much thank you um regarding precisely uh, the social challenges we are we are facing uh, nowadays our next speaker, Daniel Manzoni de Almeida from the University of Western Brittany, will be explaining to, to us how uh, the, these different challenges, such as well, ranging from, so, from climate change uh, to disinformation and hate speech, uh, the many social disruptions that COVID restrictions have been causing during the last couple of years. He will be explaining to us from drawing from his experience as a doctorate in sciences and literary theory and a researcher and writer, how teachers can, can participate, can make a difference in order to face all of these challenges and to thrive in such a difficult environment. So Daniel, if you are ready, we are ready to- Yes, everybody can hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the opportunity for talking about education today. Uh, education is very, very important in our old because the education can change in realities. I am a professor and I'm going to talk about my research field about how we can import how we can improve the teachers engage for writing and change the world. Uh, uh, my talk is going to be divided in five parts. The, five, the, the first part, I'm going to talk who I am. The second, which world we are living, why this talking about teachers, it's important. The third part is 
who are the political subjects that can make and change on the world. The fourth part is how can change how the changes we can make, and the uh, the, 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 uh, the fifth part is the conclusion about my, my talk. The first talk, who I am. I am Daniel Manzoni de Almeida. I born in, in Brazil, São Paulo, and my family is half Brazilian and half Italian, and the half a part of the Italian. I am 39 years old. I have a PhD in science and a PhD in literacy theory. Uh, in Brazil and part uh, in America. I am a science teacher education. I have an engagement for teaching science. Uh, I am from the program Bienvenue. I'm working uh, 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 how research in CRIAD, the University of the UBO. And I am working with a sci uh, citizen science. What's that? The basis of the citizenships, it's about the, the thinker, Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire is a Brazilian think, was a Brazilian think. He, uh, that thinking about the uh, education for liberty. And Bell Hooks, Bell Hooks is a North American uh, thinker. She's thinking about the, uh, critical pedagogy. That is my base for my work. And I am a work with citizenship, a citizenship science. What's that? It's a movement and a current of the students that integrate society and the scientific community, allows the population to voluntarily participate in the collective, the collection, the collection, the construction and sharing data with scientific community. An example of the, the citizenship science is on the environment. The participation of the population is sending photos of the animals or plants of the environment uh, to give them space. We have here a picture uh, that's uh, it's, uh, a charge about the citizenship science. When the population help the scientists with the data, with the discussion. And I am work with citizenship, citizenship science in education, how the teachers can improve the science education. Uh, the second eating, I'm going to talk about which world are we living in? We are living uh, on the world, have problems on the environment, problems about COVID pandemic, about immigrants, about social issues like racism, like LGBT, LGBTQ, phobia, hungriness, uh, without the vaccine, wars, we, we live in this chaotic world. And the propose is, I have a two big questions in my research. Who are the political subjects subject can make changes on the world? And the how can change be made? Let's go for the first question. Who are the political subjects can change the world? In my research, the political subjects are the teachers, the basic teachers on the high school and the university teacher on the universities. Why? UNICEF for UNICEF claims that teachers are on the most influential and the power force for equality, access and quality educa education and the key to the substantial global development. For ONU, the empowerment also means teachers have freedom to support the development of the national curricula, the professional autonomy to choose teacher, teaching methods, 
and the approaches and the beginning able to teach in safely, suffered and security during times of the political changes, instability and the conflicts they are added. What's the, the mean about that? Teachers are the important political for changing the world by the education. And the how can change be made? The importance of the right to participate on the world. I like a lot on a, uh, on an artist, uh, the uh, cow Jorge Menes Black. He is, has uh, an important uh, work about writing and architecture. And he has uh, this, uh, uh, this work that he's building a, a mirror uh, so, uh, uh, a book for, for, for show how a book can change its structures. And we can see on the picture, uh, the, the Jorge Menes Black work. And I like the narratives by Shimamanda Nigozia Dish. Uh, she has a, a, a strong book, they call The Danger of the Unique History. Uh, I'm going to uh, read uh, a, a piece of the, 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 the Shimamanda book. It's impossible talking about the unique hi hi story without thinking about the, the power. There is an ignore word that always think of, I consider the power structure in the world, Nigali. It's a noun that loosely translated to be great than order, just like the economy and the political world. Stories are also definite by principle the Nigali, how they are told, who tells them, when they are told and how many are told depends of the lot of the power. What's the Shimamanda are tell us about that? The single narrative are important. Now for my aim of my research is how the single narrative of the teachers can be written and can be changed the world. I broke to, to, to everybody an example, the book, a book that I made it in Brazil uh, with uh, a lot of teachers. They wrote the sec sequences didactic for teaching science uh, on, the, on the university. We have uh, here a lot of these chapters, these teachers, uh, that they wrote it about how they can teach and health and size uh, on the class. The second book I coordinated in Brazil is about gender and diversity, about uh, 10 chapters uh, that the teacher wrote about how they can uh, teach uh, about gender and the diversity on the class. The third, the third book, it's about teaching health. Uh, they have a lot chapter. The another teacher wrote about how they can teach in size on the class. And my conclusions, it's conclusions about important answers. How are the political subjects they can change, they can make a change on the world? has killed the authority and the importance of the teachers on the world. And the how can change be made? Developing teacher writing authorship skills, like I did in three different books for the science teachers. Thank you very much. Uh, my mails, if everybody uh, feel free for wrote me for writing me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Daniel.
uh, once again, uh, an impressive presentation for the many challenges that we are facing nowadays, uh, well, in, in, in a society defined and influenced by, by knowledge, those who actually work with knowledge, creating it, and even most importantly than that, transmitting knowledge to, to others as teachers are, uh, these are key players. I believe that no one can, can deny their, their role of key players in, in nowadays and, and in the society of the future. So thank you very much for, for your presentation and, and these and such an exciting research topic. Now we are we are getting into the last section of this of this CU talent of this CU talent webinar. Uh, this section uh, under the the general title environment, transport and health will be encompassing a research uh, research experiences and, and results from uh, researchers from, from the CU Alliance in different fields. Now, the next presentation will be delivered by Antonio Muñoz Aunión, who works as a researcher at the Public Law Department of the University of Cadiz. He will be explaining to, to us his latest research regarding the, um, well, the EU taxonomy regulation uh, and the latest action plan to, to finance sustainable development uh, across uh, the European Union. Uh, Antonio, if, if you are if you are ready, we are looking forward to, to listening what you're bringing to, to us. Okay, uh, yes indeed. Uh, do you hear me? Perfectly, yes. Okay, well, the, the title of my presentation, as you have said, is the EU, EU, European Union response to echo laundering. And the, and the title is, a, I make a question in this title, a very cap, captic, uh, eclectic question. It's a virtuous or it's a flawed circular economy that we're talking about? Well, uh, this, uh, hold on a second. I need to open my, my presentation. Hold on a second. Well, uh, for the achievement of climate objectives and the challenge of sustainability, the involvement of the private sector is considered essential. The provision of resources by the financial sectors towards sustainable business and economic activities will facilitate the transition to a low carbon economy that is more respectful of environmental and social objectives. To this end, the European Commission launched in March 2018, the Action Plan Financing Sustainable Development, which pursued this objective of integrating sustainability into financial analysis and investment decisions. The result of all this was the approval of three regulations, among which the taxonomy regulation stands out at the centerpiece. The objective of, is to determine when an economic activity is sustainable in order to establish the degree of sustainability of an investment. The objective is clear, to provide investors with information on sustainability so that they can make informed decisions on the matter, which will result in transparency and fair play rules for civil society. Well, the background, uh, let me present, let me make my presentation. Hold on a second. Okay, here, here, here. Momentito. Oh, I have to make adjustments here. Okay. Momento. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the EU Sustainable Finance and Climate Change Agenda sought to achieve the overall target of 30% of the European budget expenditure to support climate objectives. So here we have a, a, a mix of uh, public spending and uh, private spending. Uh, because as I said before, uh, the goal to, to level climate, uh, climate, cli climate change is, can only be uh, obtained with the, the, the aid of the, the private sector. Well, uh, this uh, European Sustainable Finance Plan uh, was, uh, was another instrument that adds to the European Green Deal, 
the Paris Agreement commitments, the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN principles of responsible, responsible investment, along with the principles and rights set out in the eight core conventions identified in the International Labour Organization, Declaration of Fundamental Finance, Principles and Rights at Work and, inter and International Bill of Human Rights. Antonio, I am Excuse very me. sorry. Yes, yes I was for going the to say. Uh, so yeah, I think so. <laughs> I right. think maybe Juan Ramon was going to say the same than myself that the slides are not are not passing. Las las transparencias no están pasando. Passing. Yeah. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me. I had too many. Uh, uso compartido de pantalla. Okay. Compartir. Okay. Uh, I am num in, point, in point number one in the forward. Uh, so I, you see the, the slides? Yeah, I'm afraid that we cannot see your slides at, as they are passing on. Maybe you could uh, stop sharing your screen and, and sharing it again so that we can, we can attach to the, to the actual slides as you pass them on. You mean that I, the, the, okay, stop sharing? Exactly, and, and do, do it what? again. I do what? I, I share again? Yes. Okay, I'm sharing it. All right, can you try to pass it on to the next slide? Yes, I can. All right, now it seems to, to be working. Yes, Okay. perfect. Okay, so let me, Keep going with the. Now, what are you seeing? Is my my text or my or, or the or the, or, the or structure? The... Yeah, the slide expressing the the content of the of the speech of the presentation. Okay, so I keep going now. Yes. Okay, the the search for renewable energies with no impact on the environment is spreading. For example, the capacity to generate electricity through renewable sources has increased is only in recent years, a dynamic that had its origin in the theory of sustainable development that emerged in the 1960s. I'll go now to the taxonomy regulation, which in my presentation is uh, uh, the scope of application of the regulation. Uh, well, the taxonomy regulation that is going to be analyzed is part of a package of pieces with the sustainable financial disclosure regulation, the regulation on low carbon indices, green labeling, the European green bond standards on regulation number 462 uh, slash 2013 of May, of May 2013 on credit rating agencies. The regulation acts as an umbrella for the fun functioning of the framework as is based on the founding principle of international environmental law of no significant harm, where, where, whereby it is imperative to ensure that activities do not cause transboundary damage, that is transferred from the state to the business level. Traditionally, uh, environmental protection was uh, sustained on a uh, state, state relationships. Now we uh, downplay this uh, strategy and we go to the uh, business. So business level, private sector cannot, cannot cross boundaries and they cannot uh, make uh, environmental damage. And that's, that's, that, that's, a, that's a big step. It, in this sense, it's like uh, in international law and human rights protection is what we call the, we have vertical protection and we have horizontal protection. Well, in the climate change, in the fight against climate change, we have reached the vertical and the horizontal, uh, um, uh, horizontal uh, intersection. Uh, well, which, wh why we need a, a taxonomy at the European level? Well, because we are role model. We are role model in Europe. So we have to, we have to, because we are so, we are the biggest polluters and we are the biggest investors. So we, what we do will set the pace in the future. So it's important because it's harmonized all European regulations uh, with concrete and certain definitions. 
Um, with the harmonization and the taxonomy, we go a, 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 a one step further because we get rid of coexistence of different national definitions. So a single market is open to a one harmonized taxonomy of what is a sustainable environment. And in this sense, we uh, investors, they, ha they have fair play they have uh, uh, rules that they can they can be they can be certain of its applicability. Um, there's more. It's important for consumers because consumers they can rely on the protection by the state that when they go to the financial market uh, for a for a for a for a project that is uh, eco uh, eco sustainable. Well, they know for for sure that the investment is uh, uh, is eco friendly, and that's very important to avert uh, cor corruption and to avert um, problems in the in the uh, with uh, with uh, that misleads misleads the, the consumers. Uh, uh, another important thing for a taxonomy uh, on environmental issues is that uh, investors. Uh, they know they know where they are going to invest, and they have less uh, problems with cross borders investments. That's that's a, a very important important fact. Um, another thing is that when we have a taxonomy, there is no frontiers in the, within the European Union because we all abide by the same rules. Uh, this is important. Uh, It's very important the taxonomy because it leads to a great to a big transparency in the policies on risk, adverse impacts, remuneration, promotion, and pre-contractual pre pre information of companies on sustainable sustainability. And we when we refer to companies in the European Union, we have to, to, to take account that not, not all the companies are uh, Directed to this by this regulation, by this regulation, only uh, you have to have a minimum size. But the, that's a, it's a good starting point because they will set the pace, and then other companies will avail and will comply by the, with these standards on their own will. And this is very, 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 it's, it's very important. I, I, I refer now to the scope of the application of the regulation. Uh, well. Uh, the scope of the regulation goes to the European Union and the st state members uh, when adopting measures in, or when imposing measures to operators in the financial markets. And here, the financial market is very wide uh, open. There's a, uh, there's, there's, there's very diff diff di di different uh, participants in the financial market that they are, uh, they are seized by this regulation. Uh, so in number B, you can see financial market participants offer offering financial products. Companies subject to legal obligation to publish non-financial statement or consolidated non-financial statement. Uh, Antonio, so, sorry again for, for the interruption. Could you please select the specific slide you are referring to? Oh, yes, sure, sure. At sure. this moment, I, I don't think uh, the slides you are passing on are exactly the same that we can see. Uh, at the well, this is the scope. Exactly, all right. Okay, you see the scope. All right, thank you. Uh, the union or the member state, when they adopt measures imposing on players participating in financial markets, any requirement for products to be financial markets, any requirement for products we offer under act environmentally sustainable label or rating offer under the environmental sustainable label qualification. Financial market participants offering financial products, companies subject to, to the legal obligation to publish non-financial statement or consolidated non-financial statements, uh, which are the elements of these, which are the, these financial uh, products? Well, uh, those products are those mentioned in the, in the directive 2014 slash 65, uh, which are investments in service firms, an alternative investment firm. All this is, a, is very well regulated by the, the directive and regulation that they predate to the, to the, to the, to the earliest stage 
of the freedom of movement uh, of, of free capitals. Uh, and what, what, that, that makes, and this is very sustainable because it's under the European Union, the European currency. Uh, number C of this financial instrument, insurance based, based investment products, a pension products, a pension plan, um, and other funds, pan European pension products. Those are the financial instruments that when they, when they, that way, they, that they, they need to uh, open the market to environmental products, eco land, eco and eco, uh, 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 products that they are uh, well into the into the, the climate change reduction procedure. That that to say, if you want to to have, you you have, you have a pension plan, this pension plan is obliged to uh, go to the financial market and to go uh, selecting those projects to invest that they are eco-friendly and they have to make this information available to the customers, to the customers. Which are these uh, environmental goals, goals that the taxonomy needs to, 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 take, to take into, into account? Well, first, um, instruments to mitigate the climate change, uh, adaptation to climate change. Um, sometimes we have a problem now because uh, nuclear uh, energy um, and carbon uh, industries, they are in this transition from adapt to, to adaptation to climate change. It's kind of, we are in, in the middle of a process where uh, you can be allowed to make investments in in in, in coal productions, uh, be, uh, keeping in mind that they are adapting to climate change. Uh, another environmental goal is number uh, is let us see sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources. Well, this is very 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 keen to our to to the topic that we are uh, uh, working today. Uh, D, the transition to a circular economy. And this is important because we are um, seeing a lot of progress on the uh, uh, crystal, crystal products. We are talking about uh, uh, clothing, equipment. Uh, we are talking about uh, the, 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 uh, the prohibition of this uh, uh, product deterioration, um, because the product deterioration is it, it can be it can it cannot be uh, prevented. But what we can we need to have is a deterioration that goes to a place where you can reintegrate to the to the economy. Uh, another point of six environmental goal, one of this very uh, all is pollution prevention and control, uh, letter F, protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. Uh, conclusions, conclusions. <clears throat> well, the taxonomy regulation focuses particularly on the environmental aspects of the environment, social and governance uh, <clears throat> elements with the possibility to extend it to other ambits. Uh, Nuclear energy. Well, well, what I said before, we are in the in the, in, in this transition process where nuclear energy can be uh, can be perceived as a as a as a eco friendly um, byproduct as long as it doesn't incur in this is an open ended clause. Significant harm. Only down the road we will be able to, and um, with the with the with the work of the, the European Court of Justice and the and the uh, and the uh, and the and the process to to ask for questions to the European Court of Justice, will be able to know what is a significant harm. What is is a significant harm today? May what may, may not be in the future, and, the, and vice versa is true as well. Uh, interaction with the regulation access, on access to information, participation, access to justice. This is very important because we have uh, the tendency that this taxonomy is going to be very complicated. Well, what we need is that this uh, enterprise, this uh, business, they have a liaison, they have like a compliance officer that they can refer to the public when the public they in in, in, in lay to layman terms that the public can uh, and the public can um, know 
in, 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 in terms that they can easily understand. This is very important to make, um, to make credit to this regulation Arhus, which is based, is anchored in a convention, previous convention uh, on information participation and access to justice, always related to environmental uh, aspects. Ta the taxonomy is a living instrument in consistent with commercial policy and educating financial markets. And lastly, I will say that taxonomy should interact with consumer law, specifically eco-labeling and planet obsolescence of products. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the uh, slowness in showing the slides. Thank you very much. Not at all, not at all. Thank you very much to, to you, Antonio. Uh, when it comes to, to uh, well, incentivizing and promoting sustainability, uh, apart from, from the hard science part of it, uh, there is always the uh, and, and pending importance of, of establishing actual regulations and, and to make the, the European and the national bureaucracy to move towards such goals. And that is why we need to, to research deeply into these subjects so that it can be done properly respecting uh, the, the necessary principles that rule both at the national and at the European level. So thank you very much for, you. for your uh, presentation. And the next one, uh, we are uh, jumping from, uh, from the law to the human mobility uh, research field. Uh, Agnieszka Schmilter Jarosz, uh, who comes from the University of Gdansk, she is assistant professor there at the logistics department uh, and, and has extensive experience with H2020 projects and other international projects, will be explaining to us how urban logistics uh, nowadays are facing different challenges coming from, from different flanks, we, we could say. When it comes to an increasing population, an increasing number of cars in cities, whereas there are different groups with, uh, with, contradictory, with contradictory interests sometimes, like uh, residents, tourists, commutants. And let's, let's listen to, to her presentation and what alternatives may, uh, may bring a, a sharing economy and micromobility according to her latest research. So Agnieszka, when, when you are ready. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, sorry for some small technical problems, things I couldn't. Um, uh, reach my uh, sharing screen. So now you should see everything. Um, thank you for uh, for all today's um, presentations. We have also one after mine, so I will try to uh, to stick to the time. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here for today's uh, meeting. It's really a big pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I would like to tell you something about uh, micromobility and sharing economy, but please Please treat this presentation as only a teaser to, uh, to my research since there is really a wide range of uh, subtopics regarding this micromobility and sharing economy. So I would like to present you only some a small part of uh, my research and also I like the others I will um, start with my previous background and how this idea of micromobility and sharing economy in urban logistics occurred in my case. And then I will go to my recent projects and latest findings and add in the end future prospects and some possibilities of cooperation. If there will be something um, incorrect with uh, my presentations, uh, my presentation, let me know, of course. So what is my previous background? I started uh, with my studies in uh, economics and uh, specialized in uh, transportation and logistics. And also uh, the second uh, program was management um, 
specifically quality and environmental management. And then I started thinking about uh, the urban logistics while working on the PhD thesis. It was about uh, logistics strategies in global automotive industry. And I discovered that there was some change of paradigms and some shift in uh, those uh, automotive industry, this automotive industry. Uh, there was a shift from the traditional business models to some newer ones uh, focused mostly on service, providing services, especially mobility services. And it was the beginning of my current uh, way and current uh, field of uh, research. Uh, so I was first uh, focused on supply chains and then I uh, changed my mind a little and went into the micro mobility and sharing economy. But uh, this um, source of this research interest was because of uh, the automotive industry. Uh, so my recent projects are focused mostly now on micro mobility. I was starting with this automotive industry, then went into mobility patterns and mobility choices and generational changes. And then I, I discovered that there, there are different travel behaviors and mobility patterns um, uh, different between generations, not only in my country, but worldwide. Also, we can uh, have some regional uh, differences there. And um, I discovered that we have really a big problem with uh, congestion in cities and other externalities it, it produces. Uh, so, um, then, because of uh, my uh, source uh, regarding my education in uh, quality management and logistics, I wanted to make something which will have an impact to solve the problems with uh, congestion and other inefficiencies. Because the congestion is the wasting of time being uh, uh, because of the traffic, we uh, we lose so much time. So I started thinking, oh, there is very big uh, inefficiency there. So maybe uh, we will try to solve this somehow. And that is why I was interested in sharing economy and micro mobility. And now my projects are mostly about this and also the quality of life and uh, city users needs and requirements. Since we have so many city users groups starting, uh, always we are talking about the residents but we have so many different, um, you know, groups of uh, city users, commuters, uh, tourists, um, also local authorities, they are stakeholders as well, and other public entities, NGOs. Uh, so there are uh, many of them. And even if we talk about the residents, the, the needs can be different in different parts of the city. Uh, also, the second thing, because uh, of... Um, some um, research gap about suburban areas. I've decided to include suburban areas into my research. Since I've discovered that everyone is talking about urban areas, but what with the suburban areas? Uh, we have urban sprawl, we have uncontrolled suburbanization, and it causes really a lot a lots of problems uh, in, uh, in city because everyone is going to the city during the day. And then after work and after school, everyone is going home. So we have the congestion there. Um, so I thought that this might be really a nice thing to be uh, researched. And in the meantime, we uh, we had those black swans. So first the pandemic, uh, secondly, the war in Ukraine. So I'm from Poland. We, did, we had in here really um, big, not maybe problems, but challenges regarding uh, to migration of Ukrainians uh, lately in March, in uh, February as well, and February. So I thought that it should be also included in the research, not maybe in this uh, in this uh, project I had, because uh, it is uh, quite fresh a thing here, uh, talking about, about the black swans. And what are the black swans? They are um, sudden events, unexpected ones. So uh, they are unpredictable. So we cannot, uh, you know, focus on predicting those because they are unpredicted. We have we have to learn how to be resilient. Also, talking about cities, of course, and suburban areas. 
uh, how to be resilient to avoid the problems uh, regarding black swans of different uh, characteristics because pandemic it was uh, a sharp uh, decrease in uh, uh, mobility uh, needs and then uh, uh, while we're in ukraine in this migration it was a sharp increase so we have different changes and we have to learn how to uh, face them and how to solve the problems uh, being a result um, being results from those black swans. Um, I'm also focused on first and last mind logistics, uh, um, talking about flows of goods, uh, because the crowd logistics being a part of the sharing economy is a part uh, also of uh, the first and last mile logistics. So managing flow of goods from the sender to the receiver, but omitting this main uh, transportation, um, uh, transportation channel, but uh, managing from one end to the other end um, uh, to, uh, with the, the transportation of goods. Also, um, what is uh, connected with this is Internet of Things and mobility as a service, so including information uh, technology into uh, sharing economy and micro-mobility solutions. Uh, and I would like to answer how the public and private entities should build their offer uh, to uh, solve those problems uh, with the inefficiencies and to meet the requirements of different stakeholders and um, how their offer affects now and could affect uh, uh, those uh, this life of cities and suburban areas. Uh, so how to forecast um, some, uh, so how to plan also and implement some solutions uh, and changes they will um, provide us in uh, suburban areas and urban areas as well. How could to control them, amend them, improve them uh, if they are not ideal ones. So um, maybe I will not tell um, so much I would like to about my latest findings, but as I said, I started with uh, inefficiencies uh, being results of uh, a congestion in cities. And we have really a big problem with this uh, congestion worldwide and in Europe as well, even in my country and your countries, we can uh, we have to face uh, this congestion and other, of course, externalities like no noise pollution or air pollution uh, as well. So this micro mobility, uh, so using small device, small devices and vehicles uh, to move uh, goods and to move people uh, can uh, can solve this somehow. Uh, so. Um, maybe going to the next one what are those vehicles and what are those uh, solutions helping us to solve the problem of externalities uh, so it can be this micro mobility and sharing economy and if it would be ideal if we would combine them so they can be micro cars uh, looking like this or it can be quadricycle looking like this. Uh, it can be as well some capsule of, but this is really futuristic one, uh, which helps to move people within uh, city areas. Of course, bicycles, electronic ones, traditional ones, scooters, as well, traditional ones or, or electronic ones. It can be also hoverboards. Uh, different kinds of and many many other solutions uh, and uh, they are we try uh, in my team to uh, we try to uh, research and to study how they will help in uh, solving the problem of congestion uh, and um, other producing uh, air pollution or noise pollution uh, as well. So as I said, this is really a wide range of uh, possible topics. So I gathered uh, I gathered some keywords from my latest uh, publications and they are here on the slide. So mostly it's about Europe, urban and suburban logistics. It is, about, it is about shared mobility, car enthusiasm, because we have very strong car culture. You know, in our countries, the car is really important transportation a means uh, so so people are not willing to uh, abandon this car and use something else so how to change this also i try to uh, answer the quest this question 
Uh, and future prospect, I hope um, uh, I hope you are constantly seeking as me uh, of cooperation. We had historian uh, today. We had some psychological, um, also a part of uh, the presentations. And uh, I think that we have a lot in common, and we can try to uh, to start some cooperation here. I'm very interested in cities and suburban areas, so maybe you will uh, find something here in my research interesting for you so i'm very open for the cooperation and looking for uh contact from your side and side of your colleagues so um free uh, feel free to contact me uh, anytime i'm uh, available in academia in the research gate you can use my email uh, so uh, feel free to contact me i hope that i met some time schedule thank you very much Thank you very much, Agnieszka, for for your presentation. It's uh, I think it's it's fair to say that it is quite a glance at the future of, of urban mobility. I've I've enjoyed uh, especially those uh, those provisions for for future <coughs> mobilities, for future alternatives. At the end of the day, what exists, what which currently exists, that not does not limit what might be exist in the future. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank and, you. Uh, our next and, and last presentation of this CU Talent webinar uh, will be precisely going into, well, going deeper into, into well-being. But in this regard, we are getting, instead of, of uh, environmental issues, transportation issues, we are getting into health issues, properly said. And uh, Marie Briguglio, who is a senior researcher at the University of Malta, will be explaining to us uh, her experience, her latest research findings. When it comes to, to research, uh, the impacts on well-being that the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, its related uh, restrictions have been, uh, ha have had on, on overall health well-being uh, in, in the Maltese uh, society. So, Marie, if, if you are ready, we are... Thank you. So um, thank you, everybody, for sticking around. I'll do my best to respect the time limits. I'm going to talk to you about one of our latest uh, works, uh, co-authored with Mark Carwan and Nathaniel De Bono. And, uh, and uh, if there is any time, then I will segue into the other uh, related research that I'm doing for potential collaboration. Um, I will uh, present uh, my um, paper in three um, sections, a quick introduction and literature, then I will move into the materials and methods and I'm showcasing this so that I can show you the kind of work I do so that you can gauge if methodologically we can collaborate and finding some findings and conclusions just out of interest. So the research is carried out in Malta, which I'm showing you in the map over there, it was published in Traumatology. And as you can see, Malta is right at the center of the world. So at least that's what it looks like from this map, but it is a very, very, very small country. Um, by way of introduction, Malta is a country which uh, at the beginning of the COVID outbreak and still to date is a very high economic growth country, typically scoring quite high levels of well-being, just marginally above the European average. There's a high level of social interaction in Malta, surprisingly and persistently low levels of cultural participation, except in traditional activities. The first COVID case in this context was registered on March 7th, 2000 uh, of the year 2000, rapid escalation of measures followed by the government, and there was a very fast change in lifestyle. You can see on the screen to the right there, that measure, the first case was recorded, measures quickly escalated, closure of day centers for the elderly, religious functions and masses, no outdoor activities, passenger flights halted, closure of essential retail services, and culminating in people over 65 years of age being told to stay indoors. And we conducted our survey at the cusp of this, uh, when, when this had the, uh, when all the measures sort of has escalated, we were ready to go. So in, by way of uh, background on the kind of literature that I'm in, so um, there is a literature which is 
focused on measuring subjective well-being, that is measuring well-being by asking people how they feel, okay? How there is self-assessed happiness, there is self-assessed life satisfaction, anxiety, sense of purpose, and so forth. And in this literature, we, we are now, it's a burgeoning literature, and we know quite a lot about what determines this well-being. Ah. Uh, for example, we know that income, employment, and even voluntary work are positive determinants of subjective well-being. Income to a point, so beyond a certain level of income, it doesn't really help much for one's well-being. Health, mental health, and relatedly sport and good sleep are all very uh, known determinants. Engagement in religious activities, environmental activities, and cultural activities are important determinants. Relationships, social interaction, and political trust, but also demographics like age. So we know there's a U shape in well being, gender, having children or not being able to have children, and personality. All these factors determine well being. We also know some stuff about well being in extraordinary times. For example, we know that people who were impacted by hurricanes and earthquakes experienced negative impacts in their well being but surprisingly also some positive impacts from camaraderie, getting together, volunteering and so forth. We know that the Great Depression had a very strong impact on the well-being equation measured in this kind of uh, approach. And we know that quarantine had a very strong and negative impact during SARS. So with this said, our method involved a questionnaire, just giving you a flavor of the kind of questions we asked, so the subjective well-being question, financial situation, activities in the last seven days. But in order to find out what had happened with COVID, we also asked them to recall. And of course, there is some um, hindsight bias here. We, we discussed this in the paper about life three weeks ago before the pandemic had hit Malta. We then measure exposure to COVID and worry about exposure. We look at any effects like cancelled events, having to quarantine, being swabbed, being infected, um, losing a job, even losing money, losing a family member or a friend. And we control for all the other factors that could determine well-being, including personality. We managed to collect in a very short while almost 2,000 responses. We gauged how representative this was. We did this on social media. We gauged how representative this was by comparing it to the whole population, finding that our sample is somewhat younger, more educated, and more likely to be female. This is typical of questionnaire collection rates. We then stipulated a model where well well-being is a function of exposure to COVID and all those other things I spoke about. And we stipulated a number of hypotheses. Uh, for example, that well-being would have declined during COVID, that it's linked to exposure to COVID uh, infection, for example, and that the whole well-being equation changed. So first finding is massive lifestyle change during this period, no surprises, it hardly takes a scientist to find this out. But if you look at where those two arrows are, for example, you will see that 87% of our respondents told us that their social activities had declined and 43% of our respondents told us that they had increased their level of working from home. This is just to give you a flavor of the type of lifestyle change there was. In other areas, for example, spiritual activity didn't change much. 68% told us that it remained the same. So the first finding is massive lifestyle change. Testing our hypothesis as to whether well-being declined during COVID if you look at the histogram of self-reported happiness before COVID and life satisfaction before COVID, you will see a typical right skew, okay? You will see that most people report eight and then fewer report seven or nine out of 10, okay? And very few people report zero, one or two. But if you look at what happened during COVID, this was the happiness reported by people and their life satisfaction. And you will see far more people reporting one, two, or three on the country ladder. Indeed, it was interesting. We had spoken about this. There was a lot of emphasis on the flattening of the COVID curve. You might remember this. 
And we we said in our uh, outreach that we we were observing observing a flattening of the happiness curves in Malta. So yes, we did observe a decline in well-being in COVID times to test whether exposure was responsible. This is not for you to, to go through in any detail, but just to show you the kind of research that I'm involved in. We ran regressions, we controlled for exposure and worry. We found that with the inclusion of these variables, our regression forecast a lot better. And we also found that these variables were negatively and significantly correlated with happiness. That means they significantly, that exposure and worry about COVID-19 significantly suppressed well-being. All the other variables were doing the kind of thing we expected them to do in such models. So we concluded that we found some evidence for high exposure to be associated with low well-being. Thirdly, we tested whether the well-being equation itself had, moved, had varied during COVID times. We found smaller and larger coefficients in comparison to pre-COVID times. For example, we found that engagement in artistic and sport activity and volunteering, being able to sleep and doing paid work at home were positively forecasting well-being during COVID. And we found that previous um, coefficients um, were manifesting different signs during COVID. So in short, and because I don't have much time, we did find that there was a change in the well-being equation during COVID times. We had, um, for technical people here, effectively a kind of panel of data because we had pre-COVID, post-COVID. And so we re-estimated the models trying to find out whether there were causal effects. I won't get into this. But in conclusion, what we found from this study was, first of all, a dip in happiness and life satisfaction during COVID-19. Secondly, we found that worry and exposure to COVID-19 predicts lower well-being. Thirdly, we found that being ill, being poor, having low education and being elderly was associated with lower well-being during COVID-19, while working from home, engaging in sport, sleeping well, and engaging in arts and cultural activities, which you may recall a lot of people did around the world. You know, people were doing all sorts of crafting and cooking and so forth, was associated with higher well-being during COVID-19. Caveats of my research and our method in general, we're relying on survey data, self-reporting, and indeed recall. The sampling frame may mean that there is some participation bias. So people who responded were interested in well-being and in COVID. We have excluded the hardest hit individuals who are so poor, so badly off that they can't even entertain the prospect of filling in a questionnaire. And we are careful not to attribute causality when it's merely correlational. Our recommendations, which we sent very quickly to the health authorities, were, were that while respecting social distancing, there was a lot of emphasis on social distan distancing at the time, we should be encouraging citizens to continue to exercise and to engage in artistic activities. And we said, you know, we can use television stations for this. There were a lot of public announcements we also said that we should encourage efforts to do voluntary work and to do paid work from home, and that we needed to pay attention to people aged over 60, particularly, and those who are struggling financially. The study was quite well reported in the media. So um, in one headline, they reported that the study found people's happiness was down by a third. And we also observed that our prediction, so to speak, panned out. Requests for mental health support jumped 500% since COVID. I didn't tell you my fields of interest before my talk because I wanted you to get a flavor of what I do before I do this. So I'll very briefly conclude by introducing myself. Um, I'm a behavioral economist and an environmental economist. So this is what I do, behavioral changes, environmental um, interaction with the economy. My special fields of interest are well-being, 
Environment, Politics and Culture. I'm very, very active in outreach. I've won awards for STEM outreach, for creativity, for publications, book awards, and for broadcasting. I'm very keen on having impact. And so I design a lot of my research in collaboration with the public sector. So I enter into collaborative agreements where we agree on the research to be done, which will service their policy making. I come from a 15 year career in the public service before I came to academia. Um, I, I work on a number of committees where we may also find collaboration possibilities. <clears throat> I'm on the research ethics committee. I'm on the sustainability committee of the university. I'm on the chamber of scientists of Malta and in the Society for the Advancement of Behavioral Economics. A flavor of my ongoing projects, I will conclude very shortly. I'm right now working with two uh, co-editors in order to publish a book on well-being, uh, and we're looking for papers that provide evidence of impact of well-being interventions. I'm also in a collaboration with the Malta Wellbeing Foundation, where we're working on what is called the Wellbeing Index Project, trying to design reliable metrics for the measurement of well-being in Malta in order to go beyond GDP in measuring the success of policy in Malta. I'm in a Horizon 2020 project, which looks at ecosystems-based fisheries. And here we're also looking at the well-being impacts of interaction with the marine environment. This may be interesting for a couple of you who have spoken earlier. I'm in a collaboration agreement with the Environmental Resources Authority of the University of, uh, of Malta, sorry, where we're looking, focusing on reuse behaviors in Malta. I'm concluding some work on circular practices by enterprises across Europe and in Malta. I'm in a collaboration with the Arts Council where we're looking at practitioners, their well being, their quality of life, their earnings and what drives them to become professionals in the arts. And I'm concluding a project on how the Capital of Culture Initiative impacts European identity. I made the selection of publications. I'm naturally not going to go through them, but if there's an, any interest from any of you, I divided them by field. So I, I will send this to you if you're interested. It's on my open access repository. That's my contact details. I've tried to be brief. I hope I haven't gone too fast and I thank you for st sticking around. Thank you very much, Marie. Thank you very much. It's, it's fantastic to see how, how academia may bring effective and, and uh, up-to-date advice to our public administrations in order to, to improve how, how they have done and how they are doing their their work during during these hard and challenging times so thank you very much very insightful very interesting presentation we have come to the conclusion of of this series of of presentations by by all of you before adjourning this uh, this webinar uh, laura martin uh, the project coordinator of uh, of research you would like to say a few words. So, Laura, the, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much, Juan Ramon. Well, um, I'm really impressed of, uh, of, I mean, the research that you have uh, shared with us uh, today. Um, I mean, I, I find it very accurate research work, and also I can see a lot of enthusiasm in all what you have been speaking about. And I, I really think this is uh, fantastic. Uh, Juan Ramon and myself, we are very, um, uh, we are, uh, let's say that we are, we are putting a lot of effort uh, in, uh, in this CU Talent uh, initiative that involves these webinars, different topic webinars, because we really think that, um, that we need to disseminate the research of, uh, of the new talent of our alliance. And uh, we really want to help in disseminating your research in trying to match topic of research and help you 
or uh, yes, or yes, help you in making relationships and, uh, and do research together. Um, I can see many synergies in the work, the research work that you have been speaking about today. Um, I mean, uh, for example, uh, Nicalina and Carlota have already uh, keep, I mean, uh, they, 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 they have talk a little bit in our chat, try, trying, I mean, trying to share uh, initiatives and uh, trying to, uh, to share contact. I can see uh, many synergies in, uh, for example, in what uh, Antonio uh, talked about sustainability and eco-friendly uh, production system assessment with, for example, with, with, with Agnieszka, explain about uh, new ways of transportation. I, I found really a fresh uh, presentation um, and, uh, and um, how, for example, Carol at the beginning already talked about inscription, sewing, migration, sewing, adaptation to cult different cultures from uh, Numarian to Romans and then to Christians and um, how Carlota is talking about uh, helping to, to, to protect our heritage. And, uh, and I have to say that with very um, creative initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, when she was talking about these virtual glasses or about uh, performing or developing submarine uh, heritage parts, I, I really find this very creative. Um, and uh, uh, of course, um, I uh, found it very interesting how, I mean, uh, Daniel talked about the importance of education, how education is so important, and how uh, Judita also talked about uh, this, uh, uh, the parental role of, of children and of teenagers, and this could be very important when we talk about migrations. And then for me, it has been very interesting because I've, I've more, I mean, I've, of, uh, of, I, mean, I mean, my field of research is chemistry and biology. So I found it very interesting how Marie um, proposed and present a model, a statistical, I mean, with its significance and in the statistical approach, a model of wellness that could be, I don't know, Marie, if this could be uh, applied or even uh, we could, we, could help you to get information uh, about uh, or to, to about about what is going on in uh, after COVID well-being in uh, in the countries of our alliance. Maybe this could be very interesting to to compare what is going on in, a, in every single uh, country. I don't know if uh, I, I I think that I mentioned all the participants. Uh, I'm really impressed about the the possible synergies. Because this, I mean, led us to do interdisciplinary research. And uh, I really think that interdisciplinary research serving different research topics and in different nationalities, it's going to really improve the research of our countries, of our universities and of our alliance. So uh, I really, I would like to really thank you for your participation. I would like to let you know that we are keeping in touch. This is just the beginning. And, uh, and you have Juan Ramon and myself for any support that you will need to make any contact or to go on serving uh, information uh, about your research or, or any help you will need uh, to uh, disseminate your work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. And with this, we can we can adjourn this first CG Talent webinar. I just can repeat, thank you from Laura and from myself for your participation. Thanks to all of you who have been following us. At this point, I will end the live streaming on, on YouTube.